Good morning, and welcome to Cal State LA's 2022 University Convocation. Please welcome to the stage the Chair of the Academic Senate, Dr. Chris Bezdesny. Dr. Bezdesny will introduce the university's new faculty. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, this happens to be the 75th anniversary of Cal State LA this year. So my name is Chris Bezdesny. I'm the new chair of the Academic Senate. Um, I look forward to meeting those of you I don't yet know and to continuing working with you and for you in the coming year. I'd like to begin by thanking Talia Betcher for serving as our previous Senate chair. My apologies, Talia, I couldn't see you with the plexiglass. Uh, Talia <laughs> saw us through the past two tumultuous years with compassion and grace. Her time as chair saw the Senate through our transition to remote meetings, allowing us to continue to serve Cal State LA throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. She also facilitated the Senate's swift response to many issues affecting our campus and the CSU system, ensuring that we did our best to hold ourselves to our values as an institution, even when our confidence was shaken. Under Talia's leadership, the Senate has been changed for the good. Thank you, Talia, for your guidance and care. I also want to take this moment to thank Rhonda Roquemore, who is the backbone of the Academic Senate. Without Rhonda, all Senate business would literally grind to a halt. She has been the rock supporting our Senate efforts, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you, Rhonda, for everything you do for the Senate. So as we get started today, I want to ask a question. How are you? Yeah, our campus has been through a lot this last year. First, the COVID-19 pandemic is in its third year. This spring, many of us realized the exhaustion of switching courses back from virtual to face-to-face. -face. And while we know much more about COVID now than we did in March 2020, we are still experiencing high community transmission while people continue to develop long COVID. And today the death rate was close to 1,000 in the US alone. Vaccines have made a huge difference, but are not enough. We will continue indoor masking, improving our ventilation systems, and taking other precautions known as the Swiss cheese model to help make our campus a safer place to learn. That's what it's called. <laughs> but in our third year of the pandemic, we are not out of the woods quite yet. Next, the climate crisis is now. Southern California is experiencing a historic drought, following on the heels of our last historic drought in 2015 to 2017. Wildfire season continues to lengthen and intensify and threaten our surrounding communities. Our potential for historic flooding is in the near future significantly increased. And heat advisory days and demands response events, including yesterday's statewide flex alert, are the new normal for our campus in the summer months. We also continue to see an escalation of racist, gendered, xenophobic, and ableist violence, including on our campus and throughout the CSU, unfortunately. This includes physical attacks, as well as the rise of Malthusian and eliminationist language in our discourse. We see this especially in many of the calls to return to normal that surround learning to live with COVID. The problem is, is there's really no going back to the old normal. The issues I just mentioned, which are just a few, are not new and only a sampling of the challenges that we face. These issues have been amplified in the last few years as the pandemic laid stark the ongoing inequities 
that mark our old normal. Now, I realize so far this may seem like a doom and gloom speech. Um, to quote Thor, I tend to choose to run toward our problems, not away from them. I'm also a geographer. Uh, for me, it's helpful to know the landscape, for better and for worse, in order to see the paths forward. And I see that path squarely in the mission of Cal State LA. In fact, this is a time when our mission is more critical than ever. As an institution focused on teaching, learning, research, scholarship, creative activities, and public service, we can help lead the way to creating our new reality. To paraphrase Hermes, we can model how the world could be in spite of the way that it is. Well, what could this new normal look like? The uncertainty behind that question can be disconcerting. That question will lurk behind all of the decisions we make as we return to our day-to-day -day lives on campus. And that is a question that, in many ways, the Academic Senate has taken up over the last two and a half years. The Senate is our primary shared governance body on campus and will continue to take this up in the coming year. Shared governance on our campus is the actualization of democratic principles, bringing all of our voices, needs, experiences, and expertise to the table. Students, staff, administration, and faculty. Shared governance is what allows us to take a holistic approach toward meeting our mission and toward developing this new future. It also becomes a mechanism to address the uneven power across campus, ensuring everyone has a voice in our decision-making processes. This sometimes makes shared governance a bit tumultuous, yet it also helps ensure that we hold ourselves and each other to our values as an institution. That voice in decision-making speaks to the need for an open and transparent dialogue as we shape this new normal. Shared governance is dependent on the free exchange of ideas and information. It is also dependent on all of us stopping and listening. Something I admit I continue to work on. See, speaking up within this context of an even power also requires an environment where it is safe to do so. Learning thrives in safer environments. Violence is detrimental to the learning process. This is why we must continue to focus on justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging as core principles of shared governance. This allows us to address past wrongs, prevent future ones, and provide the supportive, if sometimes discomfortable, spaces in which our learning can flourish. And finally, we've also learned during the pandemic the importance of compassion. We have experienced several collective traumas, and yet those traumas have also been experienced unevenly. The mental and physical health of our students, staff, and faculty have been pushed to and often past their limits. And yet we have continued to work toward meeting their collective needs, our collective needs. This makes compassion and trauma-informed approaches ever more critical as we progress through this year. Well, these are key factors to inform our new normal, but it doesn't really answer that original question. What could this new normal look like? That's where you, our students, come in. You will be working with our faculty and staff and administrators to lay the foundation upon which to create that new normal, to create that future. You are what our future as the greater LA metropolitan area, as California, and beyond will look like. You are young, scrappy, and hungry to learn and change the world, exactly what the 21st century needs in order to come into its own, and for us to face our challenges head on. And to help you do so, I would like to take this moment to introduce our new faculty to Cal State LA. This year, we welcome the largest cohort of new faculty, both tenure track and lecturers, in Cal State LA's history. As pointed out by 
Provost Gomez earlier this week, in our 75th anniversary year, this includes 75 new tenure track faculty. Their disciplines are as diverse as our campus um, offerings have. Uh, from music to child and family studies, from public health to pan-African studies, and from information systems to mathematics. How we have many challenges? You're joining a group of people that are dedicated to not allowing those challenges hold us back from our potential. We also try to ch face our challenges with humor, determination, and sometimes some cheesy pop culture references. This is the way. So now I'd like us to take a moment to get to learn a bit more about each one of our new faculty. We welcome the new faculty to Cal State LA. The mission of Cal State LA is possible because of the collaborative work of our faculty. It is their dedication and contribution to knowledge and social impact that fosters our diverse and vibrant campus community. We welcome the new faculty of 2022. to meet you. forward to getting to know you and sharing experiences. Most importantly, we are honored to have you. This time I would like all of the new faculty, whether you are in the auditorium or watching this via the live stream right now, please rise. And this is another reason I love Cal State LA. I don't even have to ask the audience to welcome you. I just do it with open arms. So welcome, new faculty. You represent the vision of Cal State LA. 
Your expertise, your experiences, and your voices will help us shape this future of our campus. In the classroom, through your research, scholarship, and creative activities, and through your engagement with the campus community. As you can see, we are so happy to have you with us here today. I look forward to watching each and every one of you as you learn and grow during your time on campus, and to seeing the foundation you will provide to help our students create our new normal, a future guided by what could be. Thanks everyone, and welcome to the school year. Please welcome to the stage the chair of the Outstanding Professor Award Committee, Dr. Patrick Krug. He will present the Outstanding Professor, Outstanding Lecturer, and President's Distinguished Professor Awards. Good morning, everyone. The plexiglass is tall enough. You're fine. Um, welcome to Fall Convocation. This is our opportunity to celebrate the outstanding accomplishments of our colleagues who stand out as leaders in their field and inspirations to our faculty and our students. Today, members of our committee uh, have the pleasure of recognizing six extraordinary colleagues and all that they contribute to our campus community. Uh, for the benefit of our new faculty and our guests, the Academic Senate established the Outstanding Professor Awards in 1963. Recipients of the Outstanding Professor, Outstanding Lecturer, and President's Distinguished Professor Awards are selected by a faculty committee, assisted by the Alumni Association and Associated Students. Uh, per the faculty handbook, these awards are made primarily for excellence in teaching, but significant achievements are also expected in scholarly inquiry or creativity, in professional activities, and in service to the campus and wider communities. The six recipients of the 21-22 awards exemplify these ideals. Uh, the campus provided us a pool of exceptional nominees, and the committee had to make very difficult choices. Uh, the committee spent many hours reviewing nomination letters, personnel files, course materials, and scholarly and creative work. Um, I would like to give special thanks to everyone who facilitated our review, especially Jean lazo Ui from the Academic Senate Office, who coordinated all our efforts. Thank you, Jean. I will thank the assistance to all the campus deans who made file review possible for our committee. Um, we also extend special thanks to Emily Acevedo from the Academic Facilities and Planning Office and Maria Mogolski from University Advancement. Thank you all. Um, I would like to acknowledge the other members of the OPA committee for their dedication and effort to this challenging but extremely rewarding task. Heidi Reggio from the Department of Psychology, Elaine, Elaine Draper from the Department of Sociology, Cameron Afari from the Department of Communication Studies, Holly Yu from the University Library, and Maria Ubago from Alumni Relations. A round of applause for this incredibly hardworking committee. Um, thank you. I have asked my colleagues and members of the selection committee, Professors Draper and Reggio, um, to share in presenting this year's honorees. So at this time, I would like to invite them, along with President Covino, Provost Jose Gomez, and Chair of the Academic Senate, Dr. Chris Besney, to join me on stage to congratulate and present the awards to each professor. Hello. Thanks, Pat, for your leadership of our OPA committee this year. It did great work. I uh, wanted to take a few minutes to, uh, in tribute to the filmmaker who made the six films we're about to enjoy showcasing each winner of the Outstanding Professor Awards, and that is Professor Alan Bloom in the Department of uh, Television, Film, and Media Studies.
We're continuing the tradition of the OPA committee that started eight years ago. It happened to be a year I chaired the OPA, and we were so fortunate to have Alan on the committee and that he was game to launch a new way to honor our faculty colleagues. Uh, Alan agreed to create a short documentary about each faculty awardee. He goes to their home, takes the time to get to know them, and finds surprising and engaging details about each one. Uh, to highlight, and amazingly, with the wonderful films that we'll see tonight, Alan will have created 49 films uh, showcasing faculty accomplishments. And um, Alan works closely on these films with editor Art Simon and production assistant, who happens to be Alan's son, Aaron Bloom. These films are, for me at least, the most inspiring contributions uh, our faculty have made over the past decade in showing 49 of our colleagues' accomplishments and passions. And uh, so thank you, Alan, for creating these tributes that truly honor our colleagues. Yay! <laughs> um, and, I'd also like to thank the President's and Provost's Office and the University Advancement Office for your support of the OPA Awards year after year. So we're starting uh, today with the Outstanding Lecturer Award. This year's recipient is Dr. Brenda Namey from the Charter College of Education. So please welcome to the stage Brenda Yen uh, Namey. My name is Brenda Amy, and I'm a lecturer for the Division of Special Education and Counseling. I was born in Walla Walla, Washington, and that's where I grew up. So I lived there until I went to college. And uh, I have two older siblings who, um, you know, mean the world to me. It was a very rural town at the time. I think we were famous for our sweet onions. I think I was always drawn to the helping professions. I was a psychology major at the University of San Diego. I was working with adults with severe multiple disabilities and I knew that's what I wanted to do. When I found out about the profession of orientation and mobility, well, Cal State LA has a program. At the time, I didn't realize it was maybe one of 15 in the country. I loved it. And what was amazing is that my education was paid for by the federal government. There was a need for orientation and mobility specialists. It still exists today. I don't know. I'm so thankful. You know, like my education was paid for in a profession that I still love to this day. I was just really fortunate. There was an opening at Cal State LA. It was part-time, and it was to teach in the program that I had graduated in. And I thought, oh, that would be great. And how many years has it been? That was 94. Okay, so there's math. It's been a lot of years. So I, I've been there ever since. It's the best job ever. It's called orientation and mobility. And the focus is to prepare specialists to work with people with visual impairments specifically to teach them how to travel and move independently. And uh, I teach a few other classes for the division as well. In the beginning, I was petrified. But, you know, after having done it a few times, it's gotten a little bit easier. COVID has changed everything. What we're teaching or preparing our specialists, they have to learn the skills under blindfold. You know, there's a lot of safety issues that, you know, we got to watch out. Like, they're crossing streets under blindfold. I can't monitor that from home in a video camera. <laughs> so that gave me some sleepless night. And at the time, I think there were less than 20 classes being taught in person. With a lot of restrictions, we were able to, to teach. I was so worried for the students, but they were troopers. I mean, they, we had um, gloves, masks, shields, and it really worked. I mean, it, it was good. The better they are under blindfold, the more confidence they're going to have under teaching. In 12 weeks, you're going to be crossing major intersections under blindfold and boarding buses and getting on the subway and walking downtown under blindfold. Listen to traffic and align your body perfectly parallel and to know when to go and to actually hit the opposite corner 60 feet away. That takes a lot of skill and it's exciting. They get placements in a school district with a master teacher. Then their final internship is a full-time job. They're earning a master's degree and a credential in one year. In Southern California, you know, if you're an orientation and mobility specialist, there's a darn good chance you went to Cal State LA. The big changes in our field, I think, are the assistive technology. 
I, it is so exciting. I mean, this is stuff that was science fiction when I was a kid. And in terms of independent mobility, things like accessible GPS makes all the difference in the world. And it gets you, you know, pretty darn close to where you need to go. I love Cal State LA students. I loved being one and I love this group. They are role models for their whole families and their families are sacrificing so that they have this opportunity. And the whole Cal State LA being number one in upward mobility, that is something to be pr so proud of. I get a little teary. So that's amazing. My husband and I, we like to hike. Once I met the ocean, that was it. I'm probably in the water at least twice a week. If I'm not in it, I'm walking along it every chance I get. I'm probably one of the oldest boogie boarders on the beach. <laughs> I'm out there with all the little kids boogie boarding. So please welcome to the stage, Brenda Daney. Our first outstanding professor is Dr. David Blechman from the Department of Technology. I was born in, uh, in St. Petersburg, grew up in regular classic Soviet apartment block, and you grow up with your parents even uh, when you go to college. Both of my parents were uh, engineers. But then my mom transitioned to work as a cashier in a grocery store, so that would be easy to get food. I was drafted after my freshman year in college, and the nickname I got was Professor. <laughs> when I graduated, that's when I moved to the United States. From 2011 to 2018, I was an advisor for EcoCar competition. There was a, a lot of training the students received, and we worked on real cars, converting them from gasoline vehicles into plug-in hybrid vehicles. And one year, I had 80 students on the team. You need uh, engineers, and you need expertise in multiple fields. And so leading a team like that was only possible with the help of other faculty. But what I'm really proud of in terms of my students and because of the EcoCar project, 20 students went to work uh, in Michigan. General Motors was very strategic in picking up uh, really good students, and they made job offers to many of our students a year ahead of their graduation. GM was giving them $70,000, $80,000 jobs, so students were really motivated to graduate. And what is interesting, they all purchased houses after first year. Yeah, the upward mobility really changes their lives. And if you have the projects that enable them to secure well-paying and exciting jobs that really affect their future lives, that's what we do as professors. What I like most about teaching at Cal State LA, if you want to do research and you, you want to engage and professionally grow, you also have that support that would be needed to enable those projects for professional growth. Cal State LA has a fantastic people. If you look around Cal State LA, we have an atmosphere that allows you to explore what your uh, inspirations are. Now I can use our campus as a living lab. So when I teach specialized course in photovoltaics, uh, we look at the photovoltaic installations and we have access to the data. And so I can teach uh, students about how hydrogen station works. We bring them to the station and show what are the elements, what is successful, where we need to move uh, research forward. This is a very exciting job. I don't think I exhausted the excitement of my work. That's what makes you really, really satisfied with this job. My wife is from Bulgaria. She has a PhD in American literature. She became a lawyer. We have uh, three beautiful kids, 19, 12, and 4. 
And of course, uh, without supporting each other, uh, you know, our success wouldn't be possible. I would like to thank everyone at Cal State LA. The list is enormous of all the people I have to interact and I need to rely on and the support I get from all of the people, wonderful people at Cal State LA is very important. Those projects would not be possible without other people. So let's welcome to the stage David Blackman. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. I want to take a minute to say thank you, and I'm so honored to have been uh, to be presenting these awards today, and also to have been part of the committee. Um, our second outstanding professor this year is Dr. Michael Calabrese from the Department of English. My name is Michele Antonio Calabrese, Michael Anthony Calabrese. I come from Irvington, New Jersey. Those people could recognize where I grew up from the uh, opening sequence of The Sopranos. I went to St. Paul the Apostle School and I had really good teachers. Good teachers always put you on the right path. I went to Columbia University. I got the first concentration in medieval studies. I went to graduate school for my master's and PhD at University of Virginia. I've been at Cal State these 28 years. I've been teaching medieval literature, classical literature, various other topics in the English department. I guess my mission has been to make medieval literature important and relevant to our students. When you find people's stories similar to your own, there's a sense of connection and comfort. In translating Pierce Plowman, you have a medieval poem from the 14th century. It's about people's quest for justice. So because many of the medieval texts are about building community, they fit in really well at our university with the, uh, the goal of achieving uh, common good. The phrase we use a lot on campus, it's something that we celebrate at school. I think it's a trademark of our university and i um, extremely proud to be part of it. We have an obligation to sort of keep a, an oral history alive of the people who's, who sacrificed for us. Neither of my parents finished high school my father joined the service in the Navy and fought in the war. And my mother did a year and a half of high school. And then she had to drop out to work at home because all her brothers had joined the service. Also, I'm proud to say that my mother, God rest her soul, has visited class. She's seen me teach. And my father, since of course he had never gone to school, I had him read a beautiful passage from Virgil's Aeneid. Aeneas puts his dad on his shoulders and carries him out of a burning Troy. Uh, ergo age care pater, come now, father. No great burden, jump up on my shoulder and I'll carry you out. We too will share one, one danger. And I say, no one could ever read that passage as beautifully as my dad. With the consent of the class, by unanimous acclaim, I gave both my dad and my mom an A for that day. So they, they could say for eternity, they got one A in college. And when you can have your parents who never finished high school attend a class, their son, because of all their, their sacrifices of professor, I think it was something magical. So you're always want to get up in the morning because you think you can do some good. And that's very satisfying. If you feel like you, you did something meaningful and you had fun doing it, am I deserving of this praise? What did I, what did I do? It's like, well, professor, you did something. You did your job. You cared. You know, I have outside the window growing on my balcony peppers I brought back from Calabria. And my father taught me gardening. We talk about faith. You know, what's faith, Dad? Faith is you plant the seeds. And that's one of the great things, uh, magical things about teaching. You don't know what seeds you're planting. Who 
Please welcome to the stage Dr. Michael Calabresa. Our third outstanding professor this year is Dr. Sarah Gray from the Department of Music. I'm Sarah Gray. When I was six years old, I started taking piano lessons. Then halfway through high school, I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Music was everything at that point. My parents are very, very supportive. And so I went to SMU. I applied to USC. I eventually took over coordinating the theory program at USC. And I had an email from the chair of the music department at Cal State LA at the time. This was in 2000. And he said, we'd like to interview you for the one year visiting assistant professorship that you applied for. And I got the job. I teach a lot of the core classes that we do with the undergrads. I like taking people from square one. I like working with freshmen. In a faculty meeting, I said, we don't have a class about women in music. And somebody said, well, why don't you create one? It was so inspirational. I could have women from literally any place on the planet come in for a Zoom interview. The students love it. It makes me feel like I'm doing something really valuable. Most of what I write has social justice or environmental subtext to it. I was commissioned to write a piece for the red violin. The real life violin belongs to Elizabeth Pitcairn. She said, I'd really like to commission you to write a piece for me. I was sitting at the piano and I was kind of playing through it for her. And she got out her violin and she's standing behind me playing. And I was like, oh my God, it's the red violin standing behind me playing a piece that I wrote for the red violin. And it was the actual Mendelssohn Stradivarius. I have this song cycle about gun violence against children. I have a song cycle that's about all kinds of violence, verbal or physical, against women. I wrote a piece during the pandemic called Polar Bear that's about global warming. I'm currently writing a piece that I was commissioned for the Newport Symphony in Oregon, and it's about a nature preserve up there that was the home to the Yakona tribe in 2002, I went up to Alaska because I had heard you could volunteer on a whale research boat. And I thought, that sounds like fun. I'd like to do that on my vacation. But I ended up going up to Alaska every summer for almost a decade to work on this boat. And so I ended up becoming the stranding coordinator for the Alaska Whale Foundation. But this is why we got married on Garapata Beach on January 3rd, is because I wanted to get married during whale season so that we would see them swimming by during the wedding. He's a, a brilliant conductor. We have a shared love of travel. He's the best daddy uh, between his brilliant daughter, Juliana, his two godsons, Max and Theo, and then, of course, our spitfire, Avani. He is the best daddy. One day, Avani was sitting here, and she started telling me about some fish, and I thought, she's four. How does she know all of this? And I took a video of it. I just thought, let's do one of these a day. And so every day, Avani would say, Today, I'm going to give you a tour of my winter garden. Winter has arrived in Southern California. Um, so she's my little nature girl. I've gotten to do a lot of, a lot of good things in my life. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Sarah Gray.
Our fourth outstanding professor this year is Dr. Sion Ri from the Department of Public Health. My name is Sion Ri. I'm with the School of Social Work. I'm currently serving as the director of the school. I was born and raised in South Korea. At that time, in the 60s and 70s, South Korea went through a very, very rapid economic development. I became very interested in working with people in poverty. So I decided to major in sociology. There were a lot of children in the labor force. They couldn't go to school. So uh, we organized night schools. I was admitted to Seoul National University. I was the only female student. I really cherish my college years. In South Korea, UCLA was known as a great university in basketball. I'm quite action-oriented, so that fits my personality. So I changed my major from sociology to social work. When upon graduation from my doctoral program, and then I have several teaching opportunities, and Cal State LA is my choice. I always wanted to play the cello. I started cello lessons. My children are independent, so uh, that is my dream. One, playing the piano, the other, playing the violin, and then it can be a trio. I believe health and mental health are not two separate entities. And then when we treat one thing, we have to think about the other aspect as well. So uh, one of the problems facing the Korean community is uh, domestic violence. They tend to seek help from church ministers, and yet Church ministers are not family specialists. Training church leaders is a very important task. So we developed church minister training. It is our responsibility to train social work uh, practitioners. Each year we select many students to get trained in child welfare. And then when they graduate, we can say that they are fully prepared to be a professional child welfare workers. And the children are our future, so they should be loved and protected by us. So we are very proud of our students. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Sion Ri. Our final award today is for the President's Distinguished Professor. Importantly, winners of this award are faculty members who have already won the Outstanding Professor Award and who continue to excel in teaching, scholarship, and in service. This year's President's Distinguished Professor is Dr. Stephen McGuire from the Department of Management. I'm Steve McGuire, and I'm a professor at Cal State LA in management. I started late as an academic. So my first career was a management consultant. So I worked in many different countries, 23 or 24, and I loved it. But I spent most of my time on airplanes and in strange hotels. And sometimes I'd wake up and not know where I was. Maybe life has more to offer. And so I decided to go back and get my PhD. I grew up very peaceful, loving family, uh, 12 people in our household in Connecticut. Got shipped off to university for four years where I studied a little bit of everything, really. It's a liberal arts education. And I graduated and I knew I would not get a job. 
And so I decided I better do something practical. So I went to do an MBA and I did it in Spain. Uh, when I graduated, I got a job as a junior consultant in Madrid and things worked out. I eventually became the chief executive officer of our company in Portugal and then became director of our international business in uh, Brussels. Eventually, I said, maybe I need a change. And I flew out here. And when I met the people at Cal State LA, I was just knocked over. I, I couldn't believe how nice they were. And I told them, I said, you know, I, I might do things a little differently. And they said, great. And I said, these are the kind of people I want to work with. I've never regretted that. I worked with many of the faculty in my department. I'm a university professor, and so my, my primary clientele are students. So I'll bring in people from the university, some people from the community. So I taught classes on uh, writing case studies. I taught classes on management research methods. And then I taught business research methods. And several of those resulted either in a thesis or a published paper, or sometimes both. About 300 of my students have published something. And uh, that, that, that made me very, very proud. What we do in the College of Business, I do it with John Cooper right now. I used to do it with Kathy Hansen. We provide free consulting projects to small businesses in the Los Angeles community. This is one of my favorite classes because we're using all the knowledge we have and applying in a very practical way to help companies in the community. Some nonprofits, some for-profits, and some government too. And it is so gratifying. And our students are amazing. It's more difficult, it's more challenging, and it's far more rewarding. The students love it, the clients love it, and for the faculty, it's just a joy. It just makes going in to teach, I mean, today's gonna be fun, but that's Cal State LA, you can't do that everywhere. And I, I think my whole department thinks that way too, which is really kind of nice. We have a wonderful department. I really like working with other people. You know, throwing an idea back and forth and finding work that enriches your life and having a life that fits well with your work. I, I think if we do that, we don't have to divide it up. I don't have a bad day when I go into teach. I have a good day. And I come home happy and I walk with my family on the beach. We walk our dog. I ride bicycles with my daughter on the beach. We want to go camping. We bought a tent and, and just spending time with people you love. So work-life balance is teaching what you want to teach, dealing with students you like, working on research projects that are interesting, working on consulting projects in the community that are valuable and meaningful and fun, okay? And then going home and walking on the beach. I mean, to, to ask for more than that is pretty greedy, right? Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Stephen McGuire. Thank you again. Uh, it was an honor to serve as the chair and to work with this very dedicated committee. We were all deeply inspired by the work of our honorees, as I'm sure you are too. Uh, I look to them for inspiration for a productive academic year as we move past the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, can you all please join me in one more round of applause for all of our outstanding professors? Thank you. It is a real pleasure to honor the work that they do for our students and for all of us. Um, one last thing, uh, because of the pandemic last year, we had seven awardees who could not be recognized during an in-person celebration like we are all fortunate to enjoy today. So I would like to recognize outstanding lecturer, Nicola Alenkin from the School of Social Work. Our four outstanding professors, Krishna Foster from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Simona Montanari from the Department of Child and Family Studies. 
Katherine Roberts from the School of Criminal Justice and Criminalistics. Walter Zellman from the School of Public Health. Uh, and our two President's Distinguished Professors, Choi Chatterjee from the Department of History, and John Kennedy from the Department of Music. Would you please stand so that your colleagues can join me in congratulating you with a round of much deserved applause. Thank you all very, very much. Good morning. Well, here we are, Convocation 2022. I hope that your summer has been a summer of some sort and has been all that you'd hoped for and more. I hope that as the cliches of uh, a good summer go, that you feel rejuvenated and rested and ready to welcome a new academic year. Uh, many of you here in the room have been working every day at the university all summer, so I hope that you had at least one good night before we start again. It's great to see you all in person outside the grid of rectangles, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be together again, to occupy the same physical space as we celebrate the new year. Let me begin by acknowledging some of the guests today. As you heard earlier, we are welcoming a history-making cohort of new faculty. Uh, we've hired the largest group of tenure-track faculty in the history of the university. I was reminded, as you were all being celebrated, and as we're going to do it yet again, and as many times as we can, uh, uh, I, re I was reminded of walking onto the campus of San Diego State in 1981 uh, as a new assistant professor of English. And uh, I, it was about the second week, and I was walking onto the campus, and someone shouted out, Dr. Cavino, Dr. Cavino. And I said to myself, there's another Cavino on campus. <laughs> Someone else, I wonder if it's a relative. And then I realized, no, it's me. And, and it, it, started, it started my awareness that uh, solidified that this was home, that this was my new home. So I hope that you are starting to feel as if this is your home as you join the Golden Eagle family. Once more, please, stand and let us congratulate you. I can tell you that you are joining a faculty uh, with, uh, without equal, whose commi commitment and passion and talent are unparalleled. This is also the most diverse group of faculty we've ever welcomed, and it's also noteworthy that 12 of our new tenure track faculty have come from our outstanding CSU lecturers. Let me, uh, let me also take this opportunity to introduce and welcome two new deans, Dr. Stephen Trescoma for the College of Arts and Letters, and a well-known but still new dean, Dr. Renee Blenowith from the College of Natural and Social Sciences. Stand up, please. They're sitting together, no doubt, talking about sharing budget resources, something like that. Today we also welcome staff members from across the university whom we've not greeted before because we haven't met like this for a couple of years. So would those staff members who have joined us in the last two years, since 2019, anyone who's joined us 
from 2019 forward on our staff. Could you please stand so we can say hello to you? There they are. Thank you. Thank you. So now that we're all together, staff, we, we want to welcome you again to the Golden Eagle family. Let me congratulate and introduce our newly installed president of Associated Students Incorporated, Jaime Ariano. Jaime, where are you? Jaime was sworn in as president on Monday. I had the honor and pleasure to do that. And we wish certainly our ASI president and our ASI officers all the best as we look forward to a great year of working together. Now, as we move forward, we also have to remember, of course, our emeriti faculty who are such an important part of our Golden Eagle family. Thank you for your continued commitment to the university. And today we're also joined by members of the Board of Directors for the Cal State LA Alumni Association and members of the Board of Directors for the Cal State LA Foundation. In addition to our newer staff members, uh, many of our longstanding staff are in the audience, including our facilities champions, who I'll talk about in a minute. Welcome to all of the staff who are joining us here today. We're so happy to have you with us. We've opened every academic year by gathering just as we're doing now. We've come together each fall to see old friends and meet new faculty, to share the excitement and hope that each fall brings, and to share this space together, this beautiful space, as a community. I have to say that the Luckman Theater has never looked lovelier than it does today with all of us here. And I'd like to thank Maria Magolsky, the Senior Executive Director for Donor Engagement and Special Initiatives. And Nicholas Mestas, the Executive Director, the new Executive Director for the Luckman Fine Arts Complex. and all of their staff for the great work on convocation and for the season ahead. In the upcoming months, this very stage where I'm standing will be graced by an all-star lineup across the year. Dionne Warwick, Maritza, Gloria Gaynor, legendary actress Isabella Rossellini, along with some other surprises, some really great surprises that we are still confirming. Standing on this stage is always inspirational, even standing behind the cone of silence uh, here. Reminds me of the old Get Smart show. Only people who are as old as I am will know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, okay, you don't have to acknowledge it, but. It, standing here and looking out at you reminds me of how far we've come, right? In 2020, when the pandemic forced us off campus, we moved convocation online, but we still held a convocation. In 2021, I stood here on this stage looking into a nearly empty auditorium while you watched the live stream online, but we still held a convocation. Today's gathering, today's convocation, is our first in-person one with invited guests since 2019. Once again, we're here. We should all be proud of our commitment to this gathering and all that it represents. I see our fall convocation as uh, confirmation, encouragement, inspiration, and, and a, a testament to our readiness to continue and a celebration of our dedication to a thriving university. We took care of each other 
during the early and worst days of the pandemic. And we continue to do so as we learn to live with an ever-evolving and devious virus. Our students received technology, food support, financial support from federal funding, and hundreds of thousands of community members received the COVID-19 vaccine right here on our campus at a time when it couldn't be found elsewhere. We not only served our students, we served the places they call home, and we will continue to do so. In the years ahead, much will be written about the pandemic. But apart from everything that we'll learn during that period, I couldn't be prouder of what our legacy will be. As we continue celebrating our 75th anniversary, the word legacy and all it connotes does come to mind. Today, uh, I'm talking a lot about our university and I hope there are some things that we're doing that will inspire your sense of pride and help frame our legacy. Whether this is your first year at Cal State LA or your 50th, this convocation confirms that you belong to a university community that is deeply engaged in the most important work, not only of transforming the lives of our students, but also the communities they call home and the society in which we live. We open this year against a daunting national backdrop. Inflation, mass shootings, January 6th hearings, a stunning reversal of Roe v. Wade, monkeypox, and political divisiveness that threatens the very core of our democracy. Our university history reassures me that our mission will continue, that our work of educating, empowering, and inspiring students, and taking care of one another, enriching and advancing our academic disciplines, and representing the public good will not be stopped and will push forward with a heightened sense of our responsibility to the future. Cal State LA opened its doors in 1947 and soon became a part of the allure of Southern California and its golden narrative. If Southern California was heralded as a place for new dreams and fresh starts, then Cal State LA, a premier public university in the heart of the city, was the rich soil that dreams and fresh starts require. Earlier this year, we heard from one of our older alumni who attended the first decade of the university's history, back when we were still known as Los Angeles State College, or LASC, and our mascot was the Diablo. 92-year-old Joseph Bagnall reached out to us with what I call a recorded thank you letter. For 61 years, Joseph was an educator whose deep love for Cal State LA has not waned. He's not forgotten the names of the professors who taught and inspired him, and he also has not forgotten the university's fight song. Let's hear from Joseph. 92-year-old Joseph Bagnall attended the university during its first decade. And look at this football team, 1955. Amazing. But I can't, I can't overstate what happened to me at Cal State LA. It opened every door, every door career-wise that I experienced. And my friends <clears throat> here today say, my goodness, I don't feel that way about any school I attended. But I do, I sincerely do. Joseph created a YouTube video expressing his appreciation for his time at Cal State LA. Dr. McDonald arrived 
Los Angeles State. With Professor John Tipple required rigorous graduate research. LA State prepared me to write a popular U.S. history survey. Nobody has seen my story on my YouTube channel. Virtually no viewership, but it's out there. And I want, once again, I, Cal State has shaped me, shaped my character, shaped my attitudes, gave me the skill set. That's my story. I don't care if only 11 people see it. It's always out there, isn't it? Forever. I don't know, at age 92, I deeply appreciate everything more than I ever have. I love life. I love my experiences. The, the sacred experiences in your life, the meaningful experiences. When you come to this stage of your own life, you'll realize how important parts of your life were and how important people were in your lives. A guest lecturer came in and announced that she was going to teach us the newly composed L.A. State fight song. I still remember the words and the tune. Okay, one, two, three. Boom, 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 boom. Go, Diablos. We're behind you all the way. Go, Diablos. Black and gold is here to stay. Go, Diablos. We will fight for victory. We will fight, 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 fight with all our might for dear old L.A.S.C. <clears throat> no. I messed up on the last line. Many thanks to our videographer, Emilio Flores, for that moving video. Emilio, thank you. And listen, go watch his YouTube, will you? I mean, that'd be a big surge, you know, if you just, it's about a half an hour long. <laughs> it talks all about the university in great detail. And you really, you really have to watch it. It's on YouTube, Joseph Bagnall, there it is. A lot has changed since Joseph's time at the university, including our name and our mascot. But students in those then and now photos share one thing in common. Their lives were not the same after they graduated from Cal State LA. They left here ready to begin new lives and to contribute in ways that would not have been possible without their time here. That's what each study about our success in upward mobility tells us. Cal State LA is still ranked number one in the United States for the upward mobility of our students. Now I got it, I, I, this, is not, this is not in the script. I've got, this was in uh, yesterday's Chronicle of Higher Education, okay? Uh, what would Harvard University's ranking be if the only criteria considered was economic mobility? According to the Washington Post, it would be 847th. First place would go to California State University, Los Angeles. <laughs> 
So they're talking about us. They're talking about you. You're the ones who make this happen. Keep it going. We've known this since the first nationwide study was released in 2017 by Raj Chetty and the Equality of Opportunity Project. Since that time, other studies have confirmed it. The latest study released this year, uh, last spring, by the think tank Third Way reaffirms our standing and expands our understanding of what it means for students to attend the university that's ranked number one in the nation for, uh, for upward mobility. This new study found that at, at Cal State LA, only 17% of full-time undergraduates had to take out federal student loans, while other students at other universities take years to earn back the cost of their education. Our students are able to recoup their costs within five months. And, yeah. Listen, uh, tell, tell, tell parents that, will you? I mean, I'm gonna tell them at commencement this year. I mean, tell parents, five months, five months, and it's all done. Uh, that, is, that is a really great statistic that came out in this recent study. And as the Equality of Opportunity study demonstrated, we have the highest proportion of low-income students who joined the top 20% of wage earners than any university in the country. Okay, I'll take it. It really is a very big deal, right? This spring, about 6,000 Cal State LA students graduated. In May, we constructed a commencement pavilion on campus and held beautiful ceremonies where we celebrated the graduates and their families. Thank you, James Kresma, who is the force behind commencement and our many volunteers. Our graduates are headed into careers or further studies or other ventures, but they headed there after a, just a tremendously beautiful ceremony. So a round of applause for James and all he's done. The students left here with what I'll call the Cal State LA advantage, less debt as they climb up the income ladder. This fall, a new class of students will start their journey and will reap that same advantage. We always look for ways to help others understand what it means to be number one in the nation. The very short video you're going to see takes that con concept and distills it. I should add that this video won a national award for excellence in communication from the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. Here it is. Did you know that Cal State LA is ranked number one in the nation for upward mobility? This means that we're the best in the U.S. at helping our students climb up the income ladder. A nationwide study of universities by the Equality of Opportunity Project found that Cal State LA had the highest percentage of students start college in the bottom fifth of income levels and graduate into the top fifth. A Cal State LA degree changes lives for students, their families, and their communities. Thank you to the creator of that video, Olympia Crawford, and the Office of Communications and Public Affairs. <laughs> National award-winning video. As universities across the nation struggle with declining enrollment, we are making history. As you've heard earlier, as Chris mentioned and others have mentioned to you, the entering fall 2021 class featured the largest number of undergraduate students in Cal State LA's history. A total of 23,298 undergrads enrolled in fall 2021, compared to 22,000 in fall 2020, and we're poised to continue our success. That's a lot of enrollees during COVID, right? Our domestic freshman applications increased a remarkable 16% over that number from 2021. We even exceeded our pre-pandemic application numbers. So many thanks to all of you 
who are our best cheerleaders and to our admissions and recruitment office working with communications and public affairs and our international office for implementing new ways to reach potential students and to share our story. Our students are joining an extraordinary community. We've always maintained strong ties with the larger community that surrounds us. And with those ties, we've been shaped by defining social movements. When we say we are LA, we mean it. We are making efforts to strengthen our work as a Hispanic serving institution that celebrates the cultural wealth and strength of our students, families, and communities. I'd like to recognize some faculty, among many, who are supporting several innovative HSI programs, including Dr. Claudia Diera, Dr. Alejandro Villapando, Dr. Kidogo Kennedy, Dr. Marla Parker, and Jason Chu. We all applaud your great work and the great work of your colleagues. The history of our city and this region is that much richer because as an anchor institution, we reach out and we join in. The nation's first Chicano studies program began here in 1968. The nation's second black studies program began here in 1969 with the establishment of the Pan-African Studies Department. And our history of recognizing the importance of all of our histories, those, that broad belt of histories that com, uh, comprise all the cultures that surround us, continues with the establishment of our College of Ethnic Studies. Ours is the second such college in the nation and the first in 50 years. Leading the college of, uh, leading the way at the College of Ethnic Studies is Dean Julian Malvo. <laughs> Dr. Malvo is envisioning with her faculty the work of the college in the lives of our students, the lives of our communities, in our city, and national dialogue. We are supporting the efforts of the college and look forward to continuing to support those efforts. Dean Malvo, you're here today. Would you stand and let us celebrate your dedication. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment to our newest college and its mission. This year, the College of Ethnic Studies is extending its reach into new and exciting territory with the launch of a new center and a new program to address the acute need for culturally diverse and culturally responsive health professionals. The health, go ahead, you're gonna applaud a couple more times. The Health Professions Center and its signature program the Martin Delaney Pan-African Studies Pathway to Medical School program that we abbreviate that MDPAS, MDPAS. This pathway supports students with a robust mentorship program, internships, and research opportunities as students major or minor in Pan-African Studies while completing the prerequisite courses to be eligible to apply to medical and other health career schools. With this new center, Cal State LA is poised to become a regional and national leader in producing culturally diverse and culturally responsive health career professionals who are homegrown students from and trained in our local communities. The Health Professions Center provides students with linkages to professional schools and research, tutoring, and mentoring opportunities. It's open to all Cal State LA students who seek careers in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, optometry, 
veterinary medicine, occupational therapy, physical therapy, podiatry, and as physician assistants. The Health Professions Center and the MD-PASS program already have unique partnerships or agreements with the USC Keck School of Medicine, the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine, the Western University of Health Sciences, the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Marshall B. Ketchum University, and Keck Graduate Institute. We anticipate the number of linkages to grow. This visionary work has involved many. I'd like to thank everyone involved with the center and MD Pass, including the chair of Pan-African Studies, Dr. Nana Lawson Bush, the fifth Dr. Bush. Would you please stand and let us thank you. Later this month, our students will take part in a student welcome, a kind of a student convocation designed just for them. We haven't done a student convocation before, so we're doing it now. It'll be held at the Luckman. Again, this theater will be filled, but this time the seats will be occupied by students. They'll hear about clubs and orgs and meet staff, and uh, I'll give them a pep talk, and they'll get information that will help them feel comfortable and at home on campus, so I'm certainly looking forward to that. Our staff across the university play a vital role in the success of our students, of our programs, and our operations. Without our staff, our success would not be possible. They work behind the scenes and on the front line. The staff of the divisions of academic affairs, student life, administration and finance, advancement, and the president's office have worked hard and do work hard to ensure the success of students and the fulfillment of the university's mission. Staff are often the unsung champions of our campus. This year's recipients of the Facilities Services Champion Award are with us in the audience. I'm going to call their names and also the name of another uh, staff uh, designee uh, who's won something great. And after I call your name, so listen for it now, I'm going to ask you all to stand up. So you don't have to rehearse now, we'll get to it. From our, our facilities champions then, Ulti Ramos, General Administrative Coordinator. <laughs> Custodians, Carol, Carolina Hermosillo, Patricia Barbarina. Alvaro Reyes, Rosalina de la Cruz, Evita Valencia, Hilda Castillo, and Rini Avalos, Elsa Ayala, lead custodian, Philip Rodriguez, grounds worker, Victor Pacheco, light equipment operator, Kevin La, auto mechanic, David Ayala, painter, Edward Ornelas, electrician, Hoa Pham, refrigeration mechanic, Jorge Mar Martinez, lead plumber, and Andre Gutierrez, laborer, and then there is a, an additional person that I want to group with them. I want to acknowledge Diane Taylor, who received the CSU Systems Procurement Professional of the Year honorable mention. Everybody whose name I just called, please stand up. Everybody who I just announced, please stand. All the champions, all the champions, all the champions. No, don't stand up and sit down, stand up. All right, we got him there. Our staff was very busy this summer. As you walk around, you'll see other additions, which I hope you'll appreciate. More outdoor furniture, uh, tables, chairs, and umbrellas. They've been added to places around campus. Our goal is to provide outdoor places to sit and study, to meet with friends, to eat or simply relax, uh, with charging stations, of course, nearby. Soon, you'll see a statue of our great alum, Billie Jean King, outside of the athletics building. As we mark the 50th anniversary of Title IX, we do so 
keenly aware of the role that Billie Jean King and other alums have played in advancing its goals. We are so grateful for the history that they made. You'll hear more about the official unveiling of the uh, Billie Jean King statue in the months ahead. Our staff members played a key role in advancing the dialogue that began at the CSU Juneteenth Symposium earlier this summer. An impressive number of them met in the new large student services lecture hall to watch the two-day event. And following the Juneteenth Symposium, a dedicated group of staff organized a, a Lift Every Voice set of dialogues. Campus climate conversations that will continue throughout this year and beyond, sharing ideas and initiatives to enhance diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. A Cal State LA thank you to the organizers. I am so impressed and pleased at this initiative and all that it adds to the university. So thank you all very much. S s go ahead. <laughs> Supporting our students' mental health and well-being continues to be a top priority. We offer faculty, staff, and students the opportunity to be trained in mental health first aid. This is an eight-hour course that teaches you how to identify signs and symptoms of distress, engage in non-judgmental conversations, and refer students and other individuals in crisis to appropriate resources for help. I'm happy to report that more than 1,000 faculty, staff, and students have now been trained in mental health first aid, we expect to reach more than 1,100 trained by the end of this month, and we will continue to increase that number throughout the year. The mental health first aid training is a cornerstone of our Wellbeing You initiative and was relaunched by CAPS and the Dean of Students Office in the spring after being reworked to offer in-person, hybrid, and virtual options, as well as a recertification course for those who had initial training in mental health first aid that's more than three years old. So CAPS and the Dean of Students have expanded the number of campus facilitators and have offered department-specific trainings for housing and public safety. We uh, plan to offer trainings for other departments, colleges, and students, and a dozen trainings for faculty and staff are scheduled to be available throughout the academic year. So I encourage you to get certified and or recertified and join the growing number of well-being ambassadors. I hope to see you wearing your green, is it up there? Yeah, we care, I care, let's talk button on campus so students know that you're here to help. I'll be wearing mine and we can get engaged together. From the mental health first aid training to our new community service officers and community care advocates, whom I'll discuss in a moment, we're deepening our support for well-being and expanding a culture of well-being awareness on campus. Our counseling and psychological services works very hard to meet the needs of our students. Doing this work at this moment in history requires a student's first lens, innovation, and fortitude. Under the stellar leadership of Dr. April Clay, CAPS is beginning this year with a full complement of psychological counselors and looking back on a year during which students in crisis were seen by a counselor immediately and students with less urgent needs were seen within a week. That responsiveness will continue under Dr. Clay's leadership. Last spring, we officially opened the Janice Cordova Garden of Wellbeing. It's a very nice place. It's right in between the Health Center and the Career Center, right? Uh, students told us over and over again, 
year after year, especially Debbie and me when we went to large student group meetings, how much they wanted a garden space on campus. Because of the generosity of our supporters, we dedicated that garden in April. The garden is supported by the gifts of a range of donors and is, rain, it, and is named for the late spouse of Richard Cordova, a distinguished alum who served as co-chair of our comprehensive fundraising campaign. The Janus Cordova Garden of Wellbeing is at the heart of our Wellbeing You initiative, which offers resources, programs, and events to support the mental and physical well-being of students and to promote the holistic wellness of the entire Cal State LA community. So check out the website, Wellbeing You, for podcasts, for special events that will take place on Wellbeing Wednesdays throughout the year, and an archive of great presentations from our speaker series. I must add that the unrelenting and driving force for the construction of this garden and a perennial donor to Wellbeing You and the founding voice for Wellbeing You is Debbie Cavina. Thank you, Debbie. This year, again, for the first time in history, Cal State LA received, for the first time in history, Cal State LA received a gold star from the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, the leading association of its kind. Sustain, uh, Brad Haydell is the person who has been moving this uh, initiative forward and is a central reason why we have earned this gold star rating. Uh, and this is a very big deal. It means that we're headed uh, the, in the direction of becoming golden all the way across the campus. So congratulations, thank you, Brad, for the gold star. <laughs> to be an inclusive campus that fosters belonging requires thinking in new ways of what it means to be together, particularly with the pressures, needs, expectations, and complications heightened by the pandemic. Our community is not immune to the problems and trends that we see in the larger society. Our Department of Public Safety, led by Chief Larry Bohannon, has hired a new group of community service officers to assist and serve our community. The primary role of community service officers is community outreach and engagement. These six new officers are part of our collaborative efforts to reimagine law enforcement on campus and to build trust with the community we serve. The community service officers are trained in first aid, CPR, conflict, de-escalation, and mental health first aid. Calls to our Department of Public Safety, of course, span a wide spectrum of needs. Our new community service officer, officers will expand our options for responding to, to those needs and will help us better serve our campus. Community service officers are sort of an intermediary resource, a middle space between our Eagle Patrol and our public safety officers. They are unarmed and they are in the fullest sense peace officers. The community service officers will be highly visible on campus in areas such as the student services building, student housing, and at certain events. They'll be available to help provide safety escort services, patrol parking lots, and to serve our campus uh, along with the larger core of public safety officers. Many of our new CSOs are as are our public safety officers, alumni of Cal State LA. So it's wonderful to have them with us. They will work closely with our community care advocates in our new community care program. This is a program that is run through counseling and psychological services and the Dean of Students Office. It's dedicated to fostering a safe and welcoming environment on campus. Community care advocates are trained in mediation conflict, resolution, mediation conflict resolution, 
and peace building. They can assess and peacefully diffuse a situation that may be of concern, minimizing the need to involve public safety officers. Staff, faculty, and students can request that an advocate respond to a life-threatening situation that might need de-escalation or support, such as a campus conflict or a student who is experiencing a mental health crisis. The advocates offer informational workshops about their work and collaborate with public safety to help develop public safety outreach programs to increase effective communication with students and to help build a strong relationship of mutual trust between public safety and the campus community. The Community Care Advocates Team is guided by CAPS Director Dr. April Clay and includes student, faculty, and staff advocates who are available to, to support the campus community. Student community care advocates may include interns from academic programs such as counseling, psychology, social work, criminal justice, and nursing. They are supplying us with a number of great community care advocates. So that's a mix of stuff, right? My convocation addresses are always a mixed experience. We're celebrating, we're updating, we're announcing and reflecting, especially in a milestone anniversary year like this one. And uh, in 2018, uh, speaking of milestones, we announced our first comprehensive capital campaign in the history of the university. Our goal was to raise 75 million, 75 million, by the time we reached our 75th anniversary. Well, here we are in our 75th anniversary year, and I'm proud to report that the campaign has raised more than $101 million. And there's more, and there's more. There's more great news. This past fiscal year, was the university's single largest philanthropic year on record, with more than 16.5 million in gifts received to support students, programs, faculty, research, and community service. We'll celebrate the conclusion of the campaign in October with a gala. Uh, the campaign's great success was possible because of the more than 16,000 donors who gave, including many of you. So to everyone who has contributed, our staff, our faculty, our emeriti faculty, our friends and supporters, a very deep thank you for making our campaign a success. Because of you, we will be able to enrich the lives of generations of students to come. Cal State LA's legacy of service is a bridge that links us to communities. The list of ways that our students faculty and staff serve is long, deep, and varied. We're proud of this service, proud that our community understands the critical value of service. If you've read about a wrongly imprisoned person being exonerated, and I'm speaking about some pretty important service here. If you've read about a wrongly imprisoned person being exonerated by tireless attorneys, who spent years working on the case, sometimes utilizing DNA testing, then you've likely heard of the Innocence Project, a nationally recognized network of dedicated teams pursuing social justice. What you may not know is that our professor, Kathy Roberts, director of the graduate program in criminalistics in the Chu College of Health and Human Services, has played a critical role in some of the local exoneration cases. This work is powerful and necessary and is aligned with the mission of the university. That is why I am so pleased to announce a new partnership, the Los Angeles Innocence Project at Cal State LA. By joining forces, we will intensify our dedication to transforming the lives of individuals, families, and communities. 
I'd like to introduce the director of the Los Angeles Innocence Project at Cal State LA, Paula Mitchell. Paula, where are you? Where are you? Welcome, 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 welcome. The Los Angeles Innocence Project at Cal State LA will be housed in the Shoe College of Health and Human Services, which is home, of course, to the Hertzberg Davis Forensic Science Center with its uh, labs its, and the California Forensic Science Institute, which is headed by Dr. Kathy Roberts. Kathy, where are you? There she is. Kathy got this all started, you know. But we've had a lot of help, some pretty impressive help. The partnership will be supported initially by a million dollar gift. The gift was made by an individual who knows well the work of Paula Mitchell and her team. That's because Paula and her team spent two years doing the legal work that led to his exoneration after he spent 32 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Our million dollar man is Andrew Wilson and he's with us today. Andrew, here he is. He is such an impressive person. We've spent some time talking and getting to know each other, and I hope that you will too. It is very exciting to start this project with, with uh, Andrew's support. For this, uh, through this new partnership, <clears throat> we're going to work for, I think, uh, not to you know, uh, uh, beat, a, beat a dead cliche, but this is true in this case. We're gonna work for liberty and justice for all, really, and again, to Paula Mitchell and her team of attorneys and to Andrew Wilson and his family, you are now officially part of the Golden Eagle family. So welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> this is how legacy is formed, from what persists year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. It is the path we choose to follow and the decisions we choose along the way. It is who we are and who we've always been. It is how we will be remembered. It is my great honor to be part of the Cal State LA legacy. This will be my 10th year as president of the university. And in commemoration, I am wearing the suit that I wore in 2013 for convocation, and it still fits. So I think, you know, that's a great gift from me to myself, I think. This coming year, my 10th year, will also be my last year as president. I'm planning to retire at the end of the academic year in June 2023. The incredible work that continues to take place at Cal State LA and has during my time here could not have happened without all of you, of course, the students, the faculty, the staff. So Debbie and I uh, will have a few months to, to uh, do lots of thank yous, uh, but we wanna thank all of you today for the ways in which you've helped to make our community stronger and more compassionate and simply uh, better. In the many months ahead, I'll, st I'll still be here uh, and I look forward to getting to know our new faculty and staff, staying focused on student success, well-being, safety, and expanding our commitment to campus diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Debbie and I are thrilled, thrilled to be part of the transformative energy that makes this university great. And so grateful to all of you who have established such strong foundations for the next 75 years. 
and beyond. The Cal State LA legacy will continue growing deeper and stronger because of you. Thank you and welcome back.